Hey, everybody, this is Marnie, and welcome to another edition of Perspective Transformation and AHA Moments. Today, our guest is Diane Mill, and, and we are going to be talking about unpublished to published, how to go from novice to professional. Our guest today, Diane Mills, is a best-selling author who believes her readers should expect an adventure. Her titles have appeared on numerous bestseller lists, and she's won several awards. Diane speaks and teaches writing all over the country. You can learn more about her at womenspeakers.com. She's one of our featured speakers, as well as at her own website, dianemills.com. Now, today during this conversation, we're going to talk about the number one key to moving fast forward, uh, the definition of vertical writing and how it can advance your career, three ways to increase your output, the secrets that separate rookies from pros, the five tips to ensure writing success, how to keep writing when the passion fades, and what to do when God's plan for your life feels like a mystery novel. Nobody better to talk to us about this than Diane Mills, who is a fiction mystery writer. Welcome to you. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Marnie, for having me today. Uh, I'm excited to talk to all of your writers, and it, this is going to be fun. Well, I am a fan of your writing. I love mysteries, always have since I was a young girl, and I just love that your books are clean and wholesome and mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. Thank They're a fun ride, a real fun ride. So if you guys are not familiar with Diane's writing, you can find her at Amazon, of course, or any bookseller, Diane Mills, in the mystery section. And if, let's go ahead and dive in now because we're talking today okay. to writers or aspiring writers who want to go from unpublished to publish and who want to move from that um, area of I hope to be into the area of I am. And um, we want to start with the number one key to moving fast forward toward that goal. And my recommendation is to create a mission statement. Mm -hmm. uh, a mission statement uh, is, uh, I believe it should be scripturally based, but it should have truth. It should be concise. It should be easy to understand, easy to memorize. And it propels that writer to learn, to observe, to act, and uh, to give their best. So my number one tip is to create a mission sta statement and have it someplace prominent. Don't hide it away. Don't put it in a file somewhere and, and forget where it's at. But to understand that it is why we are writing. And another aspect is to understand that life is a sacred adventure. We're all on this adventure and we're given special interests that define our purposes and it uses mm -hmm. our gifts and our talents and it molds our personalities. And for those of us who are called to write, wow, I can't think of anything else more on the face <laughs> of the earth that I would love to be doing than creating story with mystery, with suspense, with action, and showing real people who have stories in their hearts and stories that are their lives to show to us. Mm, that's beautiful. I am a big proponent of mission vision statements. And in fact, if you guys have not done yours um, at Marnie.com, you can find training on how to do that um, right at Marnie.com. There's a whole program called mission vision training. And what I've done with mine, and maybe you can respond to this, Diane, for yourself too. I did one for myself. Then I did one for my ministry. And whenever I do a major major project, I do another mission statement for that project. So it's because everything is, it all falls under the umbrella of my main mission and vision, but yet um, having the clarity in the project to know exactly what to say yes to and what to say no to, that's what I find the mission vision statements really help with. 
Oh, absolutely. I mm -hmm. have a, uh, I have a, a scripture that encompasses everything. It's like my big yep. umbrella. Yep. And then under my writing and underneath my teaching, the conferences uh, I direct and retreats and things, mm -hmm. I'll have a uh, a separate little mission statement. But we're yep. sisters with that. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't, I, uh, when I learned how to do it, it changed, it changed how I felt about the projects God was assigning me because it made them doable. Instead mm -hmm. of being just this huge, I didn't know how to say yes, how to say no, what to adopt, what to let go. The mission vision really helps clarify that for me. And it makes it very simple to, you know, just in, in the first response, say, I probably am going to say no to that, but let me just check in with God, but I'm probably going to say no, you know, or I'm probably going to say yes, let me check in and then back like that. So love that. So you have something that you do called vertical writing. So explain that to us. Vertical writing is, okay, we are in the business of learning how to write so that we can effectively communicate through the written word no matter if it's fiction or nonfiction, if it's our books, articles, uh, devotions, emails, uh, all of those particular uh, items. And, you know, we write, we edit, uh, we receive constructive and sometimes criticism that maybe not be so constructive. <laughs> and then the whole process repeat, repeats. But I look at horizontal um Horizontal thinking, horizontal writing is what we grasp from the world, what we grasp from respected writers, uh, teachers, mm -hmm. those around us. But vertically, mm -hmm. uh, vertical writing is when we look up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love what you said a few minutes before. I may have an idea to say yes or no, but I have to check in first. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I feel about vertical writing checking mm. in with God. Is this mm. what I'm supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, then I need to gracefully say no or find some, you know, another uh, venue for what I'm thinking. But that keeps me humble. Humility in this business mm. can go out the window. And I think actually it can go out the mm. window within anything. Sure. But um, seeing your name on a book is inspiring. It is yeah. an incredible, incredible uh, ego booster, however you want to call it. And for me, I don't want to ever get there. I'm, I'm glad I'm thankful, but you know what? I wrote that book, number one for God, number right. two for the reader. Right. And when you look at it that way, it makes everything, <laughs> everything different. Cause we, mm -hmm. We crave God's guidance. We mm -hmm. value the importance of prayer. We mm -hmm. praise him as our great creator. We tell others about his saving grace. But we must write vertically to encompass all the things that he has purposed for us. Yeah, so I love that. And I've not ever thought about it, like the difference between horizontal and vertical. But I think that when I think of it, I can either come up with what I can come up with, or I can mm -hmm. tap into all that God has and come up with something different because he's got so much more to bring to the project than I do. You know, so it's oh. that humility that allows us to do better, do bigger than we could ever do on our own. Oh, absolutely. And for us, for writing, it's a calling not to be worshipped, but to be used for the glory of God. And yeah. as long as we can love those readers, even when they say things that we may not value <laughs> or appreciate, not value so much as appreciate, but love on those readers and uh, guard our faith, and uh, then we are where we are supposed to be. That's yeah. the only way I can, I can say I it. love that. I love Think that vertical, vertical, vertical writing. Okay. So what are three ways to increase your output? Uh, number one, organization. And those who know my writing style, which is um, pretty much a panster, which means I know my character and everything comes out of character. It's organic according to the character's needs and wants. And then for them to learn, but I'm incredibly um, OCD about being organized. Uh, 
Uh, I use spreadsheets and I encourage that no matter what your method or your mind, the way it works, uh, be organized, make sure your goals are written, make sure you have a plan, uh, a prayerful plan. And so get organized, know where things are, and then make sure that you can uh, do a number two, a regular analysis. Um, mm -hmm. Take a hard look at your professional life and mm -hmm. evaluate, okay, am I doing the right things? Uh, how can I make my professional life uh, better? Uh, how can I write better? How can I be more effective, more efficient? And then don't be afraid to change something and then implement. And uh, I think that's good for every aspect of our lives, whether it be physical or mental or spiritual. And number three, am I reaching my target audience in the best possible way? Hmm. Do I value them? How, mm. how can I do it better? And with those of us today, that's basically through social media. And especially during this COVID, it's social media. But it's that way before when we can say we have friends around the world. But it's about them. It's not about me. Mm. And with that focus, we can... Uh, we can reach our target audience. We can find out what their needs are and see if we can help them. And the reader learns, that target audience learns, hey, that's someone who cares about me and they care about me genuinely because it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. When you were talking about organization, you referred to yourself as something, I think you said pangster. What did you say? Panster. Yeah. What is a panster? <laughs> okay, a pants stir is, um, well, you have writers who are, as I called, married to their outlines. They okay. do all of this work to outline their fiction or their nonfiction, mm -hmm. and then they follow right to it. Okay. And that would drive me crazy. Okay. Um, you know, I write that suspense stuff, and if my character finds a dead body... I want to be just as surprised as they are in my reader. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm, awesome. an answer. I, I'm just having fun. That's where my creativity is. <laughs> For that person who's an outliner, their creativity is in that outlining. Uh, mm, but that's not me. That, that's not so me. If you if you don't do an outline like that when you start your book, how do you organize your book? I organize by characterization. Mm -hmm. I have, I think it's close to 17 pages of interview questions that I ask my character about who they are, uh, uh, how they grew up. Which and this is pretty much your hero character. character. Yeah. My, yeah. I, I mm -hmm. do it for uh, all of my point of view characters, which oh, are usually okay. uh, at least two. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, the protagonist, and uh, because I write with a thread of romance, he'll be the hero, the heroine, and usually the antagonist or villain. I'll, okay. I'll stick in there. No more than three, but I will go through this intricate process so I know them. Yes. And that is... Um, that's the foundation. Vital. And then you let the story kind of evolve at it as it does. Mm -hmm. For wow, example... how fun. Huh. Yes. <laughs> For example, let's say that I have um, a little old sweet man who's scared to death of water. And um, I'm giving you this example because I think you're, you're uh, the ones listening uh, and viewing this will we'll see where I'm going with this. But this little old man is very, very afraid of water. And as a boy, he nearly drowned. And that's the reason why. So he's motivated to stay away from water. And as he gets older, he has this adorable three-year-old little grandson. And his grandson says to him, hey, Pops, can we walk around the pond, you know, where the ducks are? And the little man has to think a little bit. And he says, okay, but you have to keep holding my hand. And we don't go near the bank or the water. We stay right on the trail. And the little boy says, sure. 
So they're walking around the pond and the little boy sees some ducks and he's so excited. And so he shakes loose of his uh, granddad's hand and he goes running to the water's edge and he falls in. Okay, what is that little old man, that sweet, dear little old man, what is his greatest fear? It's water. But what is motivating him more, even stronger than that fear of water is the love for his grandson. And that's what, that's where I write from, from the needs, from knowing mm. the blind spots and, and what's in a character's lifeboat and what sacrifices yeah. they're willing to, you know, to willing to make that, mm. uh, that just happens to be my method. And as you can see, I'm quite passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> and successful at doing it that way. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for answering that question. So what are some of the secrets that separate rookies from pro riders? Okay, number one is to begin every day with God. Mm -hmm. He knows where we're supposed to be. And he knows how we should get there. And if we fuel our heart and our mind with him before engaging in the writing life, then we establish our priorities. My little saying is um, to tune into God before we tune into our computers. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah. that just works. Yeah. Number two is to write five days a week. Five days a week, commit to write on a regular mm -hmm. basis. And if you have a day job, writers, you know what? Establish time early in the morning, late at night, maybe brown bag your lunch, or instead of a coffee break, take a write break. And mm -hmm. but but write every day and be committed to that. I can remember when I wanted to write so badly and I was a single mom with four boys and it would take me, I don't know how many tries to write out a grocery list and I'm not kidding. So find the time and stick to it. Sometimes uh, a writer needs an accountability partner and that doesn't have to be another writer. That can be someone whom you trust and have them, okay, are you writing every day? And, uh, and, and that works. Uh, mm. that, that works a lot. Yeah. Uh, number three is read, read, read. Read the craft books and reread them. Read a marketing book. Read a marketing book per month if it's at all possible. Find out how the professionals are doing it. And while you're reading the craft books, uh, subscribe to blog posts whom you uh, admire and respect the following and who is, you know, who is creating the post and uh, follow those, read those, read the bestsellers. They became bestsellers because of unique reasons. So find out what those reasons are and dissect that bestseller as though it's a textbook. Underline, highlight, then figure out, okay, if that is that writer's technique, how can I apply it to mine? Mm -hmm. Then read in the genre that you, writer, want to excel in. And again, learn those tips and those tricks and those literary techniques to make sure that you're right writing sings, dances, and plays the piano, and then repeat, <laughs> and then repeat. That's great. Oh, That's great. Number. Oh, there's more. Yeah, Good. there's four and five. Number okay. four is to stay active on social media. And I touched on this before, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time there. But uh, find where your target audience or your readers are hanging out and be there. Be there for them. And number five, be aware of the outside world. I know writers who, uh, oh, I, I just can't uh, tune into what is happening in the world. It's just too difficult and too hard for me. So I, I don't ever uh, pay attention to the news or, or what's going on. And I'm thinking, how can we write fiction or nonfiction that addresses heartfelt needs if we don't know what's going on in the world. Mm 
So choose awareness, writers. Just choose awareness and be there. Awesome. Those are really great tips. So I want to just go back, circle back to a couple things. First of all, I was thinking about you said to read, 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 and you said read a marketing book a month. And I think I want to just camp there for a minute because a lot of you who haven't published a book yet, who haven't had a book published, um, have the idea that your job is the writing part and then the publicist's job is the publishing and the marketing part. And that is not the case. Um, they will help you potentially, but not nearly as much as you imagine or hope or dream <laughs> or need. <laughs> and you, you really have to do this marketing training yourself and Honestly, when I wrote the book ebooks idea to Amazon in 14 days, and that was under a, a contract situation where God had to be in this unique situation in this kind of pressure mm -hmm. cooker situation, I had to do it. And um, one of the one of the chapters in there includes writing to three audiences. You write to your reader, of course, but then you also write to the potential publisher, and you mm -hmm. also write to the media who you need to cover your book. <laughs> so what are the quotes they can pull? What are the, you know, what are the moments in the story, the, the, the moments in the, uh, in the, um, even in a how to book, where are those moments that a media person can pull out and do a sidebar on or just a pull quote or whatever. So as long as we're writing it to have this in mind that you are responsible for your marketing. Absolutely. And uh, I teach a retreat uh, about marketing and promotion for the writer with uh, Edie Melson. We teach that together. Oh, wow. And uh, we love it. But let me let me say this. And I'm making this offer. Uh, because I know at the close, we're going to uh, show them how they can contact me. But I have a multi tabbed uh, marketing and promotion spreadsheet. And I developed it and I'm always tweaking it, but marketing and promotion begin when a writer has the story or the nonfiction book idea. And what I do is make notes through every scene about things that may have a, uh, a value to a Facebook, a Twitter, um, an Instagram, a, a Pinterest board, uh, a speaking topic, a quote, or even a contest. And so by the time I'm finished with that book and I can turn it in, I know where I can go to find those things. But it's all a part of that organization yeah. that we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying that if, if uh, any of the uh, viewers are interested in seeing that, all you have to do is email me. Tell me what you want. I'll send it to you. That's great. So we're going to, again, you can just email her through her website at dianemills.com. And uh, we won't give the email here on the air, but you can go over to the website and just contact her directly through there. Awesome. Thank you for that offer. All right. Um, along these same five here, real quick secrets that separate the rookies from the pros. The other thing that you said was to um, really read in your genre, really get in there and see what's mm -hmm. working. And one of the best... Um, uh, what do you call them? Practices or exercises that my first editor had me do. She said, find a book that's in your genre that you love, a book you just love, one of your favorites, and read the introduction and then rewrite it for your own book, but using exactly the same format as your mm -hmm. beloved author used for her introduction. So she was having me work on a, on an introduction and, um, and that, and it was amazing to me. It wasn't plagiarism at all because my book was totally different from hers. I used all completely different words in her. Um, mm -hmm. but just having that, um, really coach, I would say a writing coach right there with me just for the cost of that book that I already owned uh, it was just, it was a remarkable to me. And I've used that many times when I get stuck in a, in a presentation point where, and I write pre, all nonfiction, but when I get stuck, sometimes I'll just grab one of my favorite books and just whip it open to a chapter and just see how they did it and check another chapter and check another chapter until something kind of triggers this feels like an approach I could maybe take. And there's so many resources we have right there within our own genres. 
Oh, a- absolutely. They are our best textbooks. Because when when you fell in love with that introduction, uh, or hopefully somebody falls in love with my first chapter, uh, or I fall in love with one of my favorite authors' first chapters, then I, I want to create that same enthusiasm, just like you did. Mm-hmm. And you do, by the way. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I love that aspect of uh, entertaining myself and educating myself at the same time. <laughs> I think this is my favorite part of this interview is how entertaining you are to yourself through this whole process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I just love that. So I find that much joy in the research for my books. I find so much delight in, you know, I've got these puzzle pieces already in place. And now I need the extra puzzle pieces Mm -hmm, uh, to mm -hmm. make it all coherent and flow. And that's just what that is so exciting to me, the mystery of that to me in writing a how to nonfiction. But for you to actually just discover your mystery as you go along just delights me. That is so fun. (laughs) (laughs) But just understand, I know that character, I know what they're afraid of. Uh, I know their strengths. I know their weaknesses. And so I want whatever happens to them to um, change a weakness, at least one, into a strength. Um, And uh, anyway, I I find it it fun. I think if I had not become a writer, I may have become a psychologist simply because I love behavior. And um, I was going to guess probably, detective. <laughs> oh, well, that would have been fun, too. Maybe a little both. They do have both. They do uh, now have both. <laughs> That's so awesome. That, okay, so we went through the secrets that separate rookies from pros. And did mm-hmm. we go through the five tips to ensure writing success? Um, we went through, let me see. Actually, I do have have those. I gave you five. And uh, the truth of the matter is, those five are are what? But I can go over them again. Those five oh, are to was, ensure. That's what I was uh, thinking we just did. So, okay. Yeah, I just, just wanted did to that. Sure I did. Yeah, I wanted to make sure I didn't skip something here. Okay. So how, how, first of all, have you hit writer's block or have you lost your passion at any point in your career that you would look back and say, that was a big deal for me? You know what? (laughs) No, but I understand that. And I also understand through, um, through crisis time, sometimes uh, writers are just unable to put that creativity to work. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's an escape. Uh, I mean, To me, crisis and things that are going on in reality, um, I can process them better when I'm able to free my mind and be creative. So we all are different. One thing I wanted to say is the definition of passion. And passion means anything we would give our lives for. And so when we say, you know, I have this passion for people, I have this passion for God, mm-hmm. I have this passion for writing. Mm-hmm. Now we have to think a minute, would we give our mm-hmm. lives for writing? Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe it's not so much that we would give our lives for the writing as much as the one who gave us the gift of writing. So when we look at who we're doing it for, Mm -hmm. then uh, if we're having a difficult time, then we're going to look for tools to get past it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, none of us want to be sitting in a dentist chair and be all numbed up and the dentist say, you know, I just don't feel like doing this today. I don't have the passion for it. Uh, No, we don't want that. Uh, And that's the, the, you know, the humorous side of it. And I can always find something humorous about things, but, uh, but it is true. So there are Mm -hmm. things that can um, bring us down. And understand that most writers, not all, but most writers have this melancholy spirit about them. Mm -hmm. And so we look at the world a little quirky. And sometimes we're accused of being a little eccentric or a little bizarre 
or a little just plain weird, but that's mm -hmm. okay. That way of looking at life, looking at the world is what fuels our passion for writing. And so um, sometimes we get down and we find that uh, we are having problems in our writing when we see that a, a, a date, a, a contractual date is looming over us. Mm -hmm. Or um, we have so many things going on in our lives that uh, we can't focus on what's going on. I understand that. Um, and for me to say, okay, how can we stroke the flames of creativity uh, once again, when we find we've been derailed and those, those derailments can, can happen for a whole lot of reasons. And I do understand that I've just been very fortunate never to have said, I just, I, I don't know what I'm doing, or I don't know why I'm writing this. Uh, I, I guess I just need to walk away. I may look at it as a, as a puzzle but not to the point that I am totally devastated. But um, let me give uh, all of you seven steps to help rekindle passion for a writing project that needs to be done, but you just have seen, just seem to have lost it. And number one, of course, you're not going to be surprised when I say pray for guidance to find excitement in that project again. Hmm. Number two, list List your positive writer qualities. What are the good things about your writing that you are proud of? And uh, this is this is different from being humble. This is something for you to look at. at I've been given this gift, so what are some of my positive qualities? And then place them in a place where you can look at them often. Number three. Be determined to find the enthusiasm that once excited us about the project. Except the fire may have died, but those kindles aren't going out. So we need a match. We need to get those back going again. And um, sometimes we have to, when we're striking that match, we have to think about, okay, what, what originally enthused us about the project? What are three, three things that maybe we don't like about it? And what are three things we do like about it? So analyze it and get yourself organized, mm -hmm. which leads to look at the situation as what happened to cause me to get discouraged? Uh, does the idea mm -hmm. need more uh, content, as in writing a, uh, a nonfiction, more research? Uh, have have I not expanded my topic the way it should be? Or in a fiction, uh, do I need more resources? Uh, again, more research, you know, what's it lacking? Did we learn about a, a familiar, uh, not a familiar, but a, a writing project that's very similar to ours, and now we're discouraged that ours are not mm -hmm that ours isn't good enough when the fact is we all have a unique writer's voice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes being on a deadline can offer a, a writer paralysis. And so we have to figure out how to uh, get past that. And if the writing needs improvement, then make the time to get it done. Mm -hmm. Num number five, determine to make the changes either in our professional life, our organization, or within the writing process itself. And schedule that time to get it done. And when you see things are being accomplished, celebrate. <laughs> Just celebrate. I say turn cyber cartwheels, you know, <laughs> if that's what it needs. And don't be afraid to have think time, daydream time. If that means uh, taking a walk, um, digging in the garden, uh, cooking, baking, a hobby, take a few minutes to just relax, and that helps so much. And then number seven, and this is something uh, I take very, very seriously, and that's mentoring, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a serious writer. 
when we put aside our own problems to reach out to help someone else. You know how sometimes we may be down about something and we'll reach out there and get ourselves involved in somebody else's life and then, wow, I feel better. I can I can go back and work on my own issues now. Yeah. So those are my seven um, steps to really rekindle good. the passion for our projects. Yeah, those are really great. And it will happen at some point that you either feel like you're running out of gas or whatever. And I just always, um, somebody one time told me that there's a difference between burnout and God moving us forward. So burnout is when my own flame that's keeping this thing alive dies down. But if it's God's flame, that the only way that can happen is if I cut connection. So mm -hmm. I just have to first, like you said, number one, check in with God, make sure that you're on the go with him. And then you can't actually, it's impossible for you to burn out before he's done with you for that thing. Uh, if you're connected with him, you can't really burn out because he didn't burn out. So if our mm -hmm. energy and our life is coming from him, then the only way we can burn out is, is if either we've snuffed him out of our mm -hmm. conscious awareness, or if the project is really supposed to be set aside. And there, there have been seasons, I, I use the phrase the season for a reason. You know, every, mm -hmm. every Christmas, we have the season that comes, you know, but there's yeah. seasons in our lives. And you may be in a season where you were supposed to be writing, 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 writing all this certain way, this certain direction, God may have a different time for you or whatever. So uh, I think just always checking in with him saying, am I on the right path? Am I going the right direction? And if so, just to really trust that he is going to help you. And I love just your practical, uh, concrete ways to help. Once you once you have the faith and peace that you are supposed to keep going, then the concrete ways to get back on track. Really great. Oh, it's so, so very, so very true. I feel prompted to if we have a moment here, yeah. I would love to tell the viewers how I got started writing. Sure. And it, uh, because it's kind of funny and, but it's very <laughs> serious. I always wanted to write. I wrote from the time I could hold a pencil, but I didn't mm. have any confidence. I don't know if any mm. of you feel that way, but <laughs> when we don't feel it in our gut, we don't want anyone to know what we're thinking or what our dreams and aspirations are. And I knew God was calling me, but I just couldn't do it. Well, back in 96, my husband looked at me and he said, stop telling me that someday you're going to write a book. Quit your job. I'll give you a year to get wow. anything published. You don't even have to get paid for it. But if you can get something published, if you can get going, you don't mm. ever have to go back to uh, mm. what you're doing. And wow. um, I'm five foot two. And I said, OK, um, I will do that. And that's where the organization <laughs> came in. I love it. I looked at my new job in increments of what needed to be done. And I did the same things that I just suggested for your viewers to mm. get organized, to read, to write every day, uh, to do all of those things. And the funny, amazing part about that is now my husband, uh, I, you know, the funny thing for me to say would be he works for me, but actually we partner <laughs> in the um, in the writing ministry and he mm. is amazing. But, mm. you know, viewers, that's what... That's what I'm saying to you. Mm. Get started. Accept the challenge. I dare you <laughs> to get started with your dreams. Hmm. That is a beautiful story. And there may be somebody listening to us today, Diane, that doesn't have a cheerleader like your husband was for you. And so we just want to come alongside you and say, yes. if God has put something in your heart, Oh, go for it. Just mm -hmm. go for it because mm -hmm. he will bring the people around you. He'll bring the support around you. And I don't mean necessarily to quit your day job just because we said this right now, but I do mean to look fully into the heart of God and say, what do you have for me? And to just start, you know, faith is doing what I would do if I knew for sure that God was going to do what I'm asking him to do. That's faith. And so just start as if you already know that it's going to be a fact and then let him just turn, turn your boat. You know, it's easy for him to turn something that's already moving. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, this oh, is true. That's that great. Is, I love that. <laughs> so what do we do? What do we do when God's plan for our lives feel more like a mystery novel? You are our mystery girl. What about when God? Does that <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. You mean like when we feel like we're spending days and nights looking for God's clue on what we're supposed to be doing and what does this scripture mean? And is God listening to my prayers? Um, and sometimes it seems like nights are worse because uh, we replay everything we've thought about during the day. And we all have those challenges. So I ask you, hmm. if that's the way your life is feeling, who is the hero? in our life story. And we may be quick to think we are, but that's not true. God's our hero. And the glory all goes to him. And so when yeah. we realize where we fit in the grand scheme of things and that he's the hero, we can relax knowing our lives are in charge you know, or under his control. Yes. Yeah. Then establish a problem or a goal, just like we're writing a, a mystery or suspense novel. How do we discern God's plan for us? Yeah. We have choices to make, places to go, and things to do. <laughs> Can't he simply send us a text? Well, he doesn't. Not, not <laughs> to my knowledge. If he does, I, I want to I wanna see that. Um, <laughs> but we need to be in the Word, and we need to be in prayer. Yeah. The third thing is, who is the secondary character in our life story? And that's mm -hmm. us. We're the writers. We are servants of the Almighty God, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And when we resign ourselves to letting God to take control, we can get rid of those heavy backpacks of doubt and worry and move ahead. Mm -hmm. So who is the antagonist? Uh, think about it. Uh, Satan doesn't want us to know and live God's plan. And he's determined, when I say, hey, the evil one is determined to push us in the wrong direction, discourage us, distract us. Uh, in short, he'd like for us to give up. And um, that's what we cannot do. So recognize who our antagonist is. Hmm. So how does the plot thicken? We hear lies, we fall, we get back up, we proceed forward, and it all repeats. While the victories give us momentary relief and assurance we're headed in the right direction, the defeats can be painful. Rejections are painful. But the wounds and scars are how we learn in life. And it help us to, helps us to grow closer to the image of God. So whether I am speaking to you metaphorically and, and the things that happen in our lives that help us uh, grow and change into better people, or if you're thinking about your story, that's how your heroes, your secondary characters, that's how they learn and grow into better characters. And mm. it can seem like that God doesn't care, but mm. he does. Oh, he does. Yeah. Then we have to search for clues. Are we searching in the right places? Uh, does what I does what I really, really think or do what I really think I need is is lining up with God's holiness? I'm not so sure I got the grammar correct on that, but maybe <laughs> you uh, understand. Hmm. So research your scripture. Hmm. Uh, look to see what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Hmm. Take definite steps. If we constantly ask ourselves if we are following God's path, then that mystery suspense novel we're living in opens up and we see a clearer path. And it's not for just this season, but for the seasons of all our lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every story has a resolution, Marnie. And uh, when we learn and grow from something, we can turn around and, and help someone else that's going through the same difficulty. Mm -hmm. And so on that journey, while we change and learn and grow, we can help someone else do the same thing. Uh, so by having a great resolution to our story and establishing a servant's heart, we can move forward with confidence and make that commitment for joy too. Uh, wow. 
So cool. And, and I've had so much fun with this interview. And that that was really fun how you did this last piece about the mystery with God. And it really did help me years ago to figure out that our life with God is very much like a riveting story. And yes. in a riveting story, you don't just have smooth sailing all along. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be very riveting. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. <laughs> and our story does need a really big hero. And we've got oh. one. Yes, we have. Yes, we oh, have. my goodness. Oh. This has been such a delight. Oh, thank you so much for being here. I have had more fun than I think is a person is supposed to have, but that's okay. I think that's what life is all about. It's just taking that joy and having some fun. That's awesome. Well, you guys want to check out uh, Diane's stuff over at her website, dianemills.com. Diane, what are they going to find when they get there? Oh, all the different social media platforms that we connect with, that we can connect with. Uh, you can email me directly if you have any questions. Uh, if you're looking for anything that I may have touched on while talking with Marnie, uh, just let me know. I'll, I'll help you with that. But you can read about my books and uh, look at video trailers and things of that nature. And let's just get to know each other. Let's be friends. Well, that's so nice. And of course, you're available for speaking as well at, at uh, writers' yes. conferences, but also at uh, women's ministry events. And you can uh, learn more about Diane's availability over at womenspeakers.com. Thank you once again for being here. Oh, thank you. You are so welcome. Uh, I've had way too much fun. And, and you know, <laughs> viewers, writers, take that challenge. If it's just a tiny step, be prepared to go forward. You'll never regret it. Yeah, I second that. Well, thank you guys for being here. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.